Well, so hopefully you have opened your copy of this I Have a Dream text. What I want you to do is you're going to follow along as I read and sort of analyze the text. So first of all, I highlighted I Have a Dream and I put the year and where it was given. So it was 1963 during the March on Washington. Then I gave the setting of the speech was the steps of the Lincoln Memorial and that we were trying to elicit, they were trying to elicit the credibility of Martin Luther, no, blah, of President Lincoln. Sorry, y'all, been a long day. Okay. So let's consult our directions. You're supposed to read and annotate Dr. King's I Have a Dream and pay special attention to the rhetoric Dr. King uses to make his point clear and highlight each rhetorical device using the following color key. So you can see the color key. <clears throat> let's go ahead and get started. I am happy to join with you today in what will go down in history as the greatest demonstration for the freedom of in history of our nation. All right, so that's just him sort of stating a fact, right? He's saying, I'm happy to be here to talk to you today. Today's going to be a big day in history. All right. <clears throat> then we have five score years ago, a great American in whose symbolic shadow we stand today signed the Emancipation Proclamation. And I had a student today and it was really funny. He's like, what in the world does that mean? You know, five score years ago. And so we come over here to trusty Google. And we're going to type in five score years ago and see what pops up. Okay, so a score is a period of 20 years. So five score years ago means 100 years. And the same student kind of laughed and he said, but why not just say 100 years? And I mean, it's a really good point and it's a good transition because now we can talk about the fact that in his speech, Abraham Lincoln used the term four score and seven years ago. That's the phrase he used to describe an amount of time. And he used that in a different time. So that's probably why he did it then. And then Dr. King, he is referencing, he's alluding to something that was said before by Lincoln. So I highlighted this in yellow for ethos. And then I put ethos, he's referring to Lincoln to garner some of the respect and authority from the former president. All right, so then he sort of goes on to explain, you know, the Emancipation Proclamation was signed. This momentous decree came as a great beacon of light, I'm sorry, a great beacon of light of hope to millions of Negro slaves who had been seared in the flames of withering injustice. Ooh, that's cool. All right, so, all right, so, let's get rid of this little notification at the bottom. There we go. Looking at this line, I really love it. I think it's a very powerful statement. And it's very powerful for a very serious reason. So we have a great beacon of light of hope to millions of Negro slaves who had been seared in the flames of withering injustice. So we have a great beacon of light. And I don't know if you've noticed this about me, but Miss Withers likes, um, she likes to have images to sort of, um, mm, I like images. So let's pull up a Jamboard because it's my favorite new thing. Hopefully this is the one I started earlier. Oh wait, no it's not. Hold on, that's, that's someone's. Shout out to that phenomenal student's work right there. <sighs> Do -do -do. Okay, here, this is the one I was working with. I actually already recorded this lesson, y'all, but then life got hard and it didn't save. So this is actually for later. We'll get there. But we're talking about a beacon of light, right? And so when I hear beacon of light, beacon, let's see what pops up here. Oh. 
Oh, yes. Okay. So this is what I was looking for. When I think beacon of light, I really think of a lighthouse. <clears throat> and then we also have this, you know, beacon of light. And then that is corresponding with the idea of hope. So hope. And I'm going to put this like over here in our beacon of light, right? Oh, wrong one. And so we've got two millions of Negro slaves who've been seared in the flames of withering injustice. Whoa, that's, that's big. So let's get some flames. Let's use that. There's going to be some lines, but it's fine for what we're working on. All right. So seared in the flames of withering injustice, right? That's, that's the idea we're sort of living with here. If it will ever load, let me go ahead and boom. Withering injustice. I'm such a nerd. Wither <laughs> me. Okay. So we've got that line that we are, yeah, it's got some ugly lines, but it's okay. It's not big a deal. I wish I could crop it. Can I crop it? No, it's fine. It literally doesn't matter. It It, it does to me. Okay. Hold on, y'all, you love me, right? Am I crazy? We're just gonna pretend like you do. Okay, so we've got this withering flames of injustice. I really want a PNG. Find one of those, maybe. All right, what well, feels like 20 years later, we have found our flames of withering and actually can I do it like this? We've got our flames of withering injustice. Make that red and I'm gonna make it giant. Boom. All right, so we've got our beacon of hope after this long situation with the beacon of justice. Very interesting. <sighs> okay, let's keep trekking. And so right here, the beacon of light, it works as a metaphor. And then the flames of withering injustice. Well, let me talk, speak to the metaphor a little bit. The metaphor right here, you really, we see beacons of light, we see lighthouses like this, you know, as symbols of hope, you know, coming home, all that good stuff. So that's how we come to the realization. That's how we realize that this beacon of hope is really a metaphor for getting through this scary time. <clears throat> and that is very much a piece of rhetoric trying to cause some emotion for us. So that's going to be orange. That's pathos. And then we're going to continue to this piece of really rich imagery, these flames of withering injustice, because they're not, that's not a metaphor, but it's very clear they're trying to create an image in our mind that will make us feel something. So that is going to be pathos highlighted in orange. <clears throat> Notice I am not going and highlighting the whole shebang. I actually did that in class today and I came back and I was like, I got too excited. I need to really break this down to just the metaphor, just the piece of imagery so we can hone in what is really causing that imagery. And so then we have this joyous daybreak. And I mean, joy, happiness is right there in the title, right? And I mean, when you look at this, this is obviously like our daybreak to the end of the long night of their captivity. And in this particular instance, the captivity is not exactly literal. It is a figurative sort of captivity. 
<clears throat> Let's keep going. But 100 years later, the Negro is still not free. 100 years later, life of the Negro is still sadly crippled by the manacles of segregation and the chains of discrimination. 100 years later, hold on, let me, I can't even read it like that. 100 years later, the Negro lives on, on the island of poverty, in the midst of a vast ocean of material prosperity. 100 years later, he finds himself in exile in his own land. So we have come here today to dramatize a shameful condition. So the first thing I notice when I read this, and we have this powerful repetition of this phrase, 100 years later, 100 years later. And as we look at it, you have to look beyond the repetition because the repetition in and of itself doesn't tell us if they're trying, how they're trying to persuade us. Now we're going to read beyond that repetition and see what they're saying. 100 years later, the Negro isn't free. 100 years later is sadly crippled by the manacles of segregation and the chains of discrimination. So this is obviously trying to pull on our heartstrings. It's trying to make us feel something. So that's going to be pathos. <clears throat> Look at this, the crippled. We could have said, you know, 100 years later, things are still bad. There's still segregation. There's still discrimination. But instead, Dr. King decided to say, the life of the Negro is sadly crippled by the manacles of segregation and the chains of discrimination. That builds a very real image in our minds of what's going on here. And it reinforces the emotion behind it. Reminds us, you know, this has got to change. So emotion behind it, right? As we say, that's going to be pathos. Dr. King loves his pathos. 100 years later, the Negro lives on a, lone, a lonely island of poverty in the midst of a vast ocean, vast ocean of material prosperity. Now, this line, I really like it. I think it's very powerful. You know, we've got our lonely island. So very obviously, if we're on a lonely island, they're trying to make us feel alone, feel discontent with the situation. So we got our lonely island of poverty, and then there's this vast ocean of prosperity around us. And my brain instantly went to a comparison of what was going on in American history. So that short story I already mentioned in the earlier lesson, where Elena lived in this sort of not so great apartment, right? It looks kind of run down and sad, you know, and that's where all the immigrants lived. And that was sort of our lonely island. And then over here, what we have, and over, over here we have Eugene's family in his home. And they are in this vast ocean of material prosperity. They have access to the American dream, ability to go where they want. They have this freedom that the people that the immigrants don't really have access to. And if they have access to it, they're not, they don't feel welcome. So I felt like that was a really seamless comparison right there. What Elena felt as an immigrant and then the comparison to our disconnect between her life in her apartment building of immigrants and Eugene's life in the quote, regular American apartment just across the street. So we have this island, right? A lonely island. And that's in the center of this vast ocean of material pro prosperity. Very interesting the way he does this. <sighs> then he goes on to say 100 years later, the Negro is still languishing in the corners of American society and finds himself an exile in his own land. So I kind of made this square behind our island, and that 
and then marked off. So he's languishing in the corners, right? Not, and he doesn't feel like he belongs in this vast sea, vast ocean of prosperity. He doesn't feel like he belongs in his own place. So we have come here today to dramatize the shameful condition. And yet again, we can look at that. He could have said, so we're here today to talk about it. You know, but instead he is very specific and he shows, he tries to create these images that are provoking emotion in the readers or learners or whatever you want to listeners. So I think languishing is a very emotional word. He chooses, he makes the, the choice, the cognizant choice, just choose that word. And then we could say, goodness, we could say exile. And that also is pretty impactful. So, you know, he uses this language to be very intentional and really make an impact on the people listening. We've come here today to dramatize a shameful condition. So he's laying it on really thick. You know, he's not he's not sugarcoating it. All right. So then we're going to go on and we're going to enter this really cool metaphor. So in a sense, we have come to our nation's capital to cash a check. And this is going to be a metaphor I'm going to go ahead and tell you that will come back a time and time again in this particular speech. He uses this over and over again, talking about the bank, the insufficient funds, all this good stuff. So it's really important to look at it at the beginning. What are they really saying? And so through our conversations today, we sort of broke down this metaphor. And instead of, you know, we know that when you cash a check, in literal modern times, that means you're getting money, right? You go to the bank, you say, here's my check. They give you money one way or another. <laughs> but it's not in this case. They're not really talking about a physical check that will give you money. So I said, check equals money. Nope. And then we sort of decided that the check that he was coming to cash was really equality and freedom. <sighs> and so if you want to really like break down that whole sentence, we said that the metaphor means we came here to ask for equal rights and opportunity, the ability to feel welcome in our own nation. So, you know, you come back and you think, you know, look at this, this disconnect between how I feel in my own country, the place I was, you know, born into and how other people feel this vast ocean of material prosperity and that I live in this, this, lonely island. So Dr. King is saying, you know, we have come to cash in the check and get some different, a different set of, you know, reality, get some freedom, get those rights. He has basically been given or he should be given. I guess I should rephrase. All right. Then it goes on to say, when the architects of our Republic wrote the magnificent words of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. They were signing a promissory note, so we're going back to that check, right, to which every American was to fall heir. And so I think it's very important that he gives this throwback to the architects of our republic. So he reminds the reader or the listener, he's like, you know, this is not my idea. This is not my original idea. The people that signed the Declaration of Independence the people that signed the Declaration, oh wait, the Constitution, those people thought of it first. And so that's going to be a piece of ethos highlighted in yellow. It's just a gentle reminder, you know, it wasn't just my idea. There were people before me that had the same thoughts. Okay, this note was a promise that all men, yes, black men as well as white men, would be guaranteed the unalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And I hear that line and I am suddenly like, it sounds so familiar to me and I'm not really sure why. And so me being a little detective I am, I am going to copy, oh, we're not gonna go to channel videos. That's not correct. 
We're going to come to the Google because, you know, Google's our best friend. And we're going to look up this line. So it comes directly from the Direct Declaration of Independence. So yet again, Dr. King's giving us that throwback. Hey, I'm not the only one that had these ideas. That is our ethos. That is him referencing someone that came before us. All right, let's keep trekking. It is obvious today that America has defaulted on this promissory note. And so we're going to see here this check, this idea of the check coming back a lot. This is going to really reinforce that idea. So it is obvious that today that America has defaulted on this promissory note insofar as her citizens of color are concerned. So by saying they defaulted, that's part of our extended metaphor. And that's really trying to elicit some emotion, some sympathy right there in our text. Okay, keep in tracking. Instead of honoring this sacred obligation, so, you know, cashing the check, America has given the Negro a bad check. So they gave one that they theoretically couldn't cash. A check which has come back marked insufficient funds. But we refuse to believe that the bank of justice is bankrupt. Oh my goodness, that's such a powerful metaphor. You know, we refuse to believe that the bank of justice is bankrupt. We refuse to believe that there isn't enough justice. I said this in one of the classes today, and I think it's worth repeating. You know, justice is not one of those things that we run out of it. We run out of. It is not a non-renewable resource. If the people out here can have justice, then the people on the inside can have justice. That's, I mean, that's a whole thing. But we'll get there as we read this text together. All right, so... We refuse to believe, and that would that right there would be considered pathos, but it's going to be yellow because we have a comment. It's okay. We refuse to believe that there are insufficient funds in the great vaults of opportunity of this nation. And so yet again, we've got a metaphor, you know, a this check metaphor, the money equals freedom the great vaults of opportunity of this nation. So we have come to cash this check, a check that will give us upon demand the riches of freedom and the security of justice. So here, this line is really affirming what we already believed. And I'm gonna highlight that in a color we're not even using because I think it's, it's important to note that this is a really special line. It's saying, you know, we got it right. That's what they mean, you know, that we will get freedom and justice. We have also come to this hollowed spot. And there's the ethos picking, just peeking in. We have come here to the Lincoln Memorial to remind America of the fierce urgency of now. This is no time to engage the luxury of cooling off the promises of democracy. Now is the time to rise from the dark and desolate valley. I love this, the dark and desolate valley. That is such cool alliteration. And then we have a little bit of ethos pick hopping in there because he's using biblical terms. You know, he's a minister. We know he's a Baptist minister and he just drops this valley in there and you think sort of the valley of the shadow of death that pops in there very interesting of segregation to the sunlit path of racial justice and so if you want to go back to our original you know beacon of light about our lighthouse so we're stepping into this beacon of light this hope and then it says, now is the time to make real promises of democracy. It is the time to rise from the dark. Oh, we just read that, sorry. Now is the time to lift our nation from the quicksands of racial injustice to the solid rock of brotherhood. And so we talked about today quicksands. 
And what quicksands are, you know, they pull us in. They pulls you in, catches you, and you can't get out. So now is the time to lift our nation from the quicksands of racial injustice to the solid rock of brotherhood. Now is the time to make justice a reality for all of God's children. And that is sort of a cross between our ethos and our pathos. You're feeling, you're feeling something for the fact that it's a child. You're feeling also something because there's this biblical aspect. And so as you go on, as you read through the rest of this text independently and you use our graphic organizer, I want you to really think about how Dr. King is, number one, obviously, framing his speech using rhetoric. So how is he using ethos, logos, and pathos? And then how are figurative pieces of figurative language contributing to that? But not only that, but... In Dr. King's image, what do we think his version of justice is? What does he think of when he says justice? And I really want you to ponder this as you read. What is he meaning by justice? All right. Thank you for listening. We will finish this up on Thursday. I hope you have a great Wednesday as you finish reading this text, and then we will analyze it together. As a whole class, Thursday. Have a great night. Bye-bye.